you sound great. It's just such a blessing to hear people that are not intimidated or inhibited in any way. They just worship the Lord. And I've been in a lot of places in the world, in Africa, Europe, and places where I've heard people that were worshiping just like you. And just remember that all over the world, people are worshiping and praising the Lord. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you love us, Lord. We think about that word glorious and what it means and the word hallelujah. Lord, I've been in places in the world where I did not know a bit of the, of the language, but boy, I recognize that word, hallelujah. Universal word of praise. And so, Lord, we ask you right now that, Lord, you continue to do what you've already done in worship, through the preaching of your word. And Lord, may everything be for your glory and honor. Lord, may nothing be done in any other manner but just to lift up Jesus. Lord, cleanse me, forgive me. Let me be a tool in your hand. And we pray all of this in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. Well, amen. While the children are making their way to Children's Church, I want you to take your Bibles. And I want you to turn over in the Old Testament. Thank you. Thank you. Um, turn to Habakkuk. So over in the Old Testament, you would go past some of the major prophets, and you'll keep uh, going past Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Lamentations. You'll get over there to Daniel. Go past uh, Hosea and Amos, Jonah. You keep just kind of thumbing your way along. You go past Micah, Nahum, and you'll finally come to this book called Habakkuk. Um, in the Hebrew, it's the word Habakkuk. Habakkuk. And um, so I don't know about you, but I'm glad I don't have the name Habakkuk. But anyway, that's, that's the name in the Hebrew. The, it, 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 the name means embraced or to embrace. Let me ask you a question. How many of you are huggers? Got huggers in the room? Sheila's a hugger. Uh, Sheila, lo she's a good pastor's wife. She loves to hug people. Um, it's, it's her love language. She loves to let people know, you know. It's powerful when you and I are hugged. Now, men, we're just a little bit reluctant to do that, but I kind of envy those Eastern cultures to where they, you know, men will embrace. They'll even they'll do that kiss on both sides of the cheek. You know, raising boys, sometimes I'd kiss them. You know, oh, Dad. But, you know, it, 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 there's just something about being embraced, about being hugged, about being loved. Um, I learned something from my dad. Sometimes when I take a man's hand, I'll put a hand on his shoulder and squeeze his shoulder to let him know that he's loved. And, uh, that, you know, that's important. Everybody, everybody wants to be embraced. People want to be loved. Uh, you know, a lot of times even among the homeless, when you're out among them. I, I love Alan because Alan has such a heart for the homeless. And it's powerful when you hug a man or a woman and you let them know, you know, that I, that I love you, that I care. And that's what this name, Habakkuk, Habakkuk, that's what it means. It means to embrace or to be embraced. Now, in, it's written about 610 B.C., somewhere around that time. Uh, the Israelite, the Jewish people are not behaving very well. I've, I've told you that Dr. King, Dr. King loved the minor prophets. And if you listen to Martin Luther King Jr., you're, you're going to hear a lot in his speeches that centers around the minor prophets because the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, were not at a good place. Uh, they were practicing idolatry, but the bigger thing was they were practicing injustice. There was a lot of injustice among the Jewish people. And so the minor prophets were addressing that so you could see why Dr. King would be drawn to the minor prophets. Then in Habakkuk chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, the oracle that Habakkuk the prophet received. How long, O Lord, must I call for help but you do not listen or cry out to you violence. That word violence 
is translated Hamas. Does that sound familiar? Hamas. That's the word for violence. For cry out to you violence, but you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? God, why do you tolerate wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed. And justice never prevails. The wicked him and the righteous so that justice is perverted. Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. For I am doing something in your days that you would not believe even if you were told. I am raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwelling places that are not their own. They are a feared and dreaded people. They are a law to themselves. They promote their own honor. Their horses are swifter than leopards, fiercer than wolves at dusk. Their cavalry gallops headlong. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like a vulture swooping to devour. They all come bent on violence. Their hordes advance like a desert wind and gather prisoners like sand. They deride kings and scoff at rulers. They laugh at all fortified cities. They build earthen ramps and capture them. And they sweep past like the wind and go on guilty men whose own strength is their God. O oh Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, we will not die. Oh, Lord, you have appointed them to execute judgment. O oh, rock, you have adorned them, ordained them to punish. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? And why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than yourselves. You have made men like fish in the sea, like sea creatures that no rule, that have no ruler. The wicked foe pulls all of them up with hooks and catches them in his net. He gathers them up in a dragnet, and so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore he sacrifices to his net. He burns incense to his dragnet, for by his net he lives in luxury and enjoys the choicest food. Is he to keep on emptying his net, destroying nations without mercy? Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We pray, dear Lord, that you'll help us to understand your word. And we give you glory, and we pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. I want to ask you a question. Have you ever been at a place in your life where you looked up and said, God, I don't understand what you're doing right now? Okay, I want you to listen. Everybody, everybody look this way. Has there ever been a time in your life when you were going through a crisis, a trial, or some difficulty that you basically prayed and said, God, I don't understand what you're doing right now. It doesn't make a bit of sense. In fact, God, if I were to be honest with you, it looks like nonsense. It looks like confusion. I, I don't understand what you're doing. And, and, and you just kind of cry out to God. You know, I was reading something that, or, or I heard something that Patton said. General Patton said this, and we had a, we had a deacon in this church. Gene Harris, you'll remember, um, but we had a deacon in this church, uh, um, Doug Rawson. Uh, Doug, who had served with Patton, marched with Patton. And a lot of times, Clyde, Gene's husband, Clyde and I would sit down with him and ask him questions out of World War II and what it was like to serve under Patton. And Doug, one of our deacons, would always get, you could see him visibly get upset. And you know what the first thing he would say? He would look at us and say, Patton got a lot of men killed. He was with him in North Africa. He was marching 
up through Africa heading toward to cut off Adolf Hitler and the Nazi troops. Patton made this statement. Patton said he would never take the counsel or the appraisal or the words of a wounded soldier coming out of battle. Isn't that interesting? And I thought about that. He would never, he would never receive the report or the counsel or the appraisal of the battle from a wounded soldier coming out of the battle. And he went on to make this statement because it would always be tainted by his woundedness. Now think about that. Let's go back to the question. Has there ever been a time in your life when you looked up toward God and you said, God, you're not making any sense whatsoever right now. I don't understand what you're doing. And to be honest with you, God, I don't know that you're doing anything. In fact, let me go farther, because I've been there. Have you ever looked up toward heaven and said, God, if you're really real, if you're true, if there really is a God, then God, you need to intervene right now. Because God, right now, my faith is in danger. I love the old African, the old black man who was in a, in a field one day and he looked up toward the heavens and he said, God, your property is in trouble. This is a backup. His name means embraced. He's in a nation that is in moral depravity. He's in a nation where there's so much injustice, so much lack of mercy, lack of compassion. He's in a nation that in all accounts is totally depraved. It is absolutely, as he looks at it, helpless and hopeless. In fact, he says this. He says the law is paralyzed. Think about that for a moment. Think about the city you live in. Would you say the law is paralyzed? Would you say that, you know, I was, we were, uh, Bell and, and Russell and Ken and Allen and all their family were down in Jane Avenue over in West Jackson taking the gospel, sharing in a, in a, in a place where we hope to put a satellite, where we hope to put a preaching point and and uh, man, it was just so much fun to visit with them and to see what God was doing there on that corner in that area. And I told them, I said, you're like salt, light, and yeast. But I'll be honest with you. Be, be, let me be honest, Russell, and say there was a sense of helplessness. There was a sense of hopelessness. There was almost the feeling in the in, in a, in a crime-ridden area where even the community center says there's no church that is operating in this part of the city. They've all closed. It was almost a feeling of as if the enemy was standing there with his arms around me trying to embrace me and to fill me with a sense of despair as if I wanted to look up toward the heaven in the case of the city of Jackson and say, God, where are you? What are you doing up there? Because there are a lot of good people in this city. That was Habakkuk. Habakkuk was basically saying, look at verse 2 there. He says the oracle that Habakkuk the prophet received. So this is an oracle. The word there would be burden. Have you ever been burdened about something? you just heavy? So he says here in verse 2, he said, How long, O Lord, must I call for help? But what? But you do not listen. In other words, God, how many times am I going to pray and call out to you? It, let me ask you this. Is there something that you're asking God to do right now in your life that really, in all honesty, you've just about given up even asking anymore? Do you know what Jesus said in Luke 18, 1? He said, men ought always to pray and listen to this and never give up. And he went on to tell about a woman who had been abused and mistreated treated unjustly, and she kept going to this judge, knocking on his door, and saying to the judge, I need, I need the law to help me here. I'm in a bad place. I need a judge. And you know what Jesus said about the judge? He, the, he said the judge didn't care for God. He had no belief, no faith in God. He had no care for his compassion, no mercy for his fellow man. He was hard and cold. You know what Jesus said about that judge? 
He said the woman just kept literally going over and over again, demanding justice. He said, finally, the judge is about to pull his hair out. And he said, lest this woman drive me crazy, I'm going to answer her request. And you know what he said? And he said, if, God, if, if that unbelieving, uncaring, unmerciful judge would show mercy to that woman because she persevered, then the reality is, he said, how often do you and I give up when God is just saying, persevere and keep praying? Habakkuk says, God, how long am I going to pray and you don't listen? Now watch, he goes on. Or cry out to you violence, Hamas. Right now we're looking at Israel. Right now, once again in this making national news. Let me tell you something about Iran. The fastest growing church in the world right now is in the underground church of Iran. Guess what church parallels it? The underground church in China. Exploding in growth. So don't just simply uh, take some proposition and not realize that, wait a minute, I've got many brothers and sisters in Christ that are in the underground church in, in Iran, as well as those that are messianic followers of Christ among Judaism. And let me tell you, we've got work in every Islamic country in the world. But what he says here, he says, God, how long do I cry violence, Hamas, but you do not save? In other words, God, I'm, I'm literally at a point right now where I'm getting beat up and kicked around. Everything's going wrong in my life. There's injustice all around me. Whatever it may be, whatever that need, that prayer is, right now and it may be literally physically where you're suffering and you're saying God I'm crying out to you and God you're not answering in fact listen to this he doesn't say you're not capable of hearing he says God it's a matter of your will you're choosing not to listen that's a strong statement isn't it now watch this Verse 3, why do you make me look at injustice? Oh, wait a minute. Let me, let's just close here. Let's have prayer and close because I don't want to put, I don't want to make any of you uncomfortable. Because the truth of the matter is, for many of us, what we want to do, we want to slip out of here as quickly as we can and go back into our little sheltered life and live out the rest of our life. We don't want to crawl up under a bridge. We don't want to see a senior adult who's living like a prisoner in South Jackson. We don't want to see the injustices sometimes in law enforcement or profiling. We don't want to see the poor man that goes to the ER, the ER and because he doesn't have adequate coverage, he can't get the help that he needs. We don't want to see injustice. Tuck me away in a multi-million dollar facility out in the suburbs and let me literally walk this narcissistic view of faith. God, I don't want to see injustice. Thank God that Habakkuk says this as a prophet of God. He says, God, watch this. Why do, why do you make me look at injustice? I always remember, and I'll never forget it, in our, in our homeless ministry, I, I remember one time I, I had a Sunday school class for the homeless. And, and these are men and women that were living on the streets. I knew them. A lot of times they bring me gifts. I would get coffee pods that had been thrown away in the bin behind Dollar General that were brought to me because they said, we know you love coffee and we wanted to bring you some coffee. And I would see the X through the expiration date. It had long since expired. And I knew where it had come from. It had come out of a trash bin where they had been uh, going into the bin and were bringing me these coffee pods. And man, I tell you, Alan... I'd put my best face on. I didn't care how old it was, how dirty it was. I'd wipe the top of that pot. I'd stick it in that coffee maker and make it and then go, oh, this is such a good cup of coffee. And it was. I remember one time with a group of homeless men and women they met in this sanctuary. And when I came into that door right there, they were all just all excited and they were just talking away, going at it. And, 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 I, and, I, and I said, 
I was getting ready to pray. I said, before we pray, I said, well, y'all are really excited. And man, they looked and said, so-and-so down on the corner here just a moment ago coming to church got a $20 bill begging on the corner. Well, my first response was, are you going to tithe? And then I said, then I asked this question. I said, what did they say? They, ca- they all looked at me as if I had thrown cold water on what, what do you mean, what did they say? I said, you know, I said, well, it was, a, it, it was a guy. He was in a black BMW. And he pulled up and he gave me a $20 bill. They, they were distressed. I said, well, what did he say to you? He said, he didn't say anything. Well, I, I, I tried to press it a little bit. I mean, you mean the person came up, opened the window, handed out a $20 bill and didn't say anything? And they started laughing. And they made their statement. They said, Brother Jeff, they started laughing as if I was some kind of nut. They said, Brother Jeff, they don't say anything. And then this is what got me. They don't even look at us. And I said, you mean to tell me that somebody gave you a $20 bill and didn't even look at you, didn't say anything? I said, why? And one of them, who's now dead, murdered on the streets, was speaking to another who died at University Medical Center with no family, buried in a pauper's grave. You know what they did? They looked at each other, they smiled, and they said, because if they look at us and they see our eyes, then we exist. And they don't want us to exist. Habakkuk says, why? God, do you make me look at injustice? I'm going to tell you the problem with the church in America today. The problem with the church in America today is it's so stinking sorry, materialistically westernized that it no longer looks anything like the New Testament church that we see in the Scripture. And hey, listen, that's white or black. So he says you make me look at injustice. And and Habakkuk is angry at God because look at what he says next. He says, God, I want to ask you a question. Why do you tolerate wrong? You ever think that, God, why do you allow evil? You know, think about it. The devil, God, why don't you just kill him? He is. He will take care of him one day. But he says here, why, God, why, why do you tolerate wrong? Why do you allow evil to continue? Why do you, listen, let me say this, why do you allow these things to happen to me? Now watch this. Destruction and violence are before me. There's strife and conflict abounds. In other words, he said everywhere, all around me, he says among the Jewish people, they're in the, they're, they're in the southern kingdom, of Israel. They're about to be invaded by the Babylonian army. He's sitting there talking about how bad things are. How bad? You ever listen to Christians talk about how bad things are? Things are just so bad. All this world is in such a mess. Oh, they just start talking and just pour mouth and how bad things are. That's what Habakkuk is doing. Saying, God, things are so bad. Now watch this, verse 4. He says that things are so bad, God, the law is paralyzed. Justice never prevails. The wicked him and the righteous so that justice is perverted. You know what he said? Hey, uh, if you don't believe that, go visit some people's homes around here. I remember one day walking up, and I was walking door to door, going over and um, talking to people. I came up to a man. He was outside. He was cleaning his car right over here, African-American gentleman. And he was cleaning his car, and his kids were right there. A couple of his children were close by. And I told him who I was, where I was from, and, and uh, he stopped and he was talking to me. And his wife, beautiful African-American young woman, probably late 30s, comes out and she's crying. And she looks at me and says, as, as like a man of God, she looks at me and says, we've moved, we've moved, she's crying. She said, we've moved from over here in West Jackson. We've moved from West Jackson and we came here. And she said, we've been robbed three times in one month. In one month. 
and she just wept. You know what she was saying? Look at verse 4. The law is paralyzed. Justice never prevails. Now watch this, the wicked, him, and the righteous. You know what that means? So that justice is perverted? That means that the righteous live like prisoners in communities because the wicked have caused them to do that. Does that sound familiar? Where people live behind, hey, who lives behind bars? People who live in so many criminal ridden communities where they live behind the bars in their own homes. And a backache. And you know what he's saying? He's saying, God, where are you? Where are you? Now watch this. Verse 5. And somebody said this. Betty, Miss Betty, I think that was you. When I got to this part, somebody said, the Lord's answer. Right? It's the Lord's answer. Because here he is, he's just complaining to God, he's irritated, he's angry at God, and he's crying out and he's saying, God is just not right. And you're not doing anything about it. And then in verse 5, God says, look at the nations and watch them be utterly amazed. For I'm going to do something in your day that you would not believe, even if you were told. You know what, God says, listen, everybody listen. I'm not going to keep you long. You know what he says, God says? He says, Habakkuk, you ever had somebody, well, let me put it this way. Somebody looks at you and says, you know, you're, you're not doing anything about it. You know, you may be in a position of authority or a position where you have the power to do something and they look at you and they go, you know, you're not, you're not, you, you just seem like you're not doing anything. Sheila would do that sometimes when raising kids. She would look at me like, I'm, or, do you hear what they're saying? Can you hear what they're doing? You're not doing anything. Let me tell you what I would do sometimes. Oh, I'm doing something. Yet, you see, sometimes we look at God and we say, well, God, you know, you're not doing anything. Listen to this. If you don't hear anything else, God is always working. God never goes on vacation. He never steps away for a moment. God's always working. And the Bible says this, the Bible says, for all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. In other words, what God's doing, even the worst possible things that are happening in your life, whatever may be going on in your life, God is knitting it together for, listen, for your good and his glory. That's what he's doing. Uh, you know, you remember the needle point? I don't know if y'all ever did this, but my mom had those little hoops and she would sit there and do that little needle point through there. I never really understood that, but I think it was therapeutic to her. Now, everybody knows if you've ever seen that from the back side of it, it looks like a royal mess. I mean, there are threads and whoa, it just looks like a, a mess. But when you turn it around, you look at it from the other side, I mean, all of a sudden, it makes perfect sense. You look at it and you see, listen, you know what your life may look like sometimes in my life? It, we're looking at it from the back side. In fact, let me tell you what the Bible says, what he says, because in chapter 2, in chapter 2, verse 1, and we're not going to have time to get to that, you know what Habakkuk says? You know what Habakkuk says? This is what Habakkuk does. He says in chapter 2, verse 1, he says, I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me. And what answer I am, I am to give to this complaint. You know what he says? I'm going to sit right here, God, and I'm not going to move until you answer me. Do you hear me, God? I've made some good questions here. Why is evil prospering? Why is justice not prevailing? God, why are, the, why are righteous being hemmed in by the wicked? God, why do you tolerate evil? And God, on top of that, when you finally give me an answer, you tell me that you're raising up the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar to come down here and to whoop us? How can you use somebody more evil, more wicked, to correct somebody that's more righteous? God, I don't understand. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to sit right here, God, until you give me an answer. I'm not moving until you give me an answer. That's what he says. And you know what God says? Can you read on a little bit farther? We don't have time. You know what God says to him? He says these words. 
And this is what Habakkuk comes to. Everybody listen. The just shall live by faith. You know what that means? Look at this. Right now, y'all are a blur. Y'all are a blur. I mean, y'all look like blobs. So if, if, if your makeup's not right, don't worry about it. I have no idea. If you had a bad hair day, I don't have any idea. You know, no matter hey, you, if you're sleeping right now or you're bored, be happy. I have no idea. But listen, when I put these on, 2020. 2020. Now I want you to listen. You know what God's going to say to Habakkuk and all of his complaining? God's going to give him an answer. God, first of all, says this, Habakkuk, I've, I know what's going on with my people. I know there's injustice. I know there's a lot of things that are wrong. And I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring the enemy of Israel down, and I'm going to spank their bottoms. I'm going to discipline them. That's what I'm going to do. That's what God said. But listen to this. The just shall live by faith. You know what that means? That's this right here. Everybody, everybody take, take your imaginary faith glasses and put them on your head right now. Okay, because that's what it means. You see, the just shall live by faith is this. I'm going to, instead of complaining and griping and, and accusing God of not being aware of my situation, I'm going to put my faith glasses on, which means this. I'm going to live by a biblical worldview. I'm not listening to the news. I listen to the news as I interpret it through the Word of God. I'm not looking at my life as one crisis after another. I'm putting my faith glasses on, and I'm saying, God, you're sovereign. You're in control. The word sovereign comes from the word Adonai. It means that he's master. He's in control. It means he's king. Now, you may say, well, if he's in king, then what does it matter what I choose? Hey, listen, just because a kingdom is ruled by a king doesn't mean the citizens have a right to exercise their own free will. They just come under the discipline and the correction of the king or the punishment. So God tells you and I, he says, listen, he tells what he's telling Habakkuk, what he's saying, Habakkuk, what he's telling Habakkuk, he's saying, Habakkuk, put your faith glasses on and start looking through my eyes. And what that means is this, and I'll close in a moment. When we say, and you've heard me say it, Theologically, God's transcendent. He's outside of time, space, and matter. God looks at his creation, all of it. And God, just like a life board on a life game, God's sitting there looking at your life, and you're going, you're going, God, I don't understand. I can't hear you right now. You're silent. You seem to be indifferent. You're not listening. Hey, listen, you may not be there right now, you young parents, but you'll be there one day. And in that moment, you're going to say, you know, God, I don't see anything, but God, God help me to put on my faith glasses and to realize that a transcendent God is above all of his creation. And God, I need your wisdom, which means I need to see my life or those people I love from your perspective. That's what I need. And God says, when you begin to see that, you'll know I'm at work. Now let me close with this. Uh, this past uh, few weeks, in fact, about three weeks ago, I, I, by the time I got through preaching, uh, I came down here and Sheila knew something was wrong with me because she could tell we've been knowing each other for 50 years, so that's a long time. So she knows me. She could tell in the prayer. Uh, when she looked, I was leaning against the platform. She knew something was wrong. I've been struggling. I, I have a stint in the Widowmaker. Uh, when I had uh, that put in, I was 95, 99% blocked. So I had a 1% chance that I could drop dead in a moment. Uh, put that in, and uh, but I've noticed that I've been having trouble breathing. Um, I went out and was helping Jeffrey a little bit, and he finally looked at me and said, Daddy, you're all right. Sheila noticed that. So I had an echocardiogram last week, and, and that, that, then they did a stress EKG. They did the one where they shoot you with whatever they shoot you with, and you're laying on a table, and they're looking at your heart. 
So, I, you know, I left out of that, uh, got home, and Friday afternoon, the doctor, my cardiologist called. It's bad when your cardiologist calls you from his cell phone. You know it ain't good. <laughs> and uh, Jeff, yes, uh, this is Chris Morford. Uh, and I could tell he was concerned. He said, look, we, we've got some problems. And uh, we're going to, we, and, and I think he, reg he hated the fact that he couldn't immediately get me in. In fact, he said, look, if you have any pain, go to the ER. Uh, there's a problem in the back of your heart, and I don't know. We're going to have to cath you. He had talked about open heart surgery before, and uh, that may, I may not be eligible for the stent at all this time. So I don't know. You know, I don't know what, I don't know what the future holds. But I can tell you this much, I know who holds the future. And so, you know, in this moment, you can look up and you can say, well, you know, I can look up and say, well, God, I don't, I don't understand what you're doing. I'm busy. I've got more going on. Uh, I spoke Southern Electric on Monday. I spoke at First Baptist Flora Tuesday. I spoke here Wednesday. Uh, God, I'm a, I'm a busy man. I, I, you know, I don't have time to be sick, God, right now. You know, this doesn't make a bit of sense to me. And God says... I've got this. And there's some things that I'm going to be doing in your life and in the congregation and in people's lives. Um, I'm in the middle of Medicaid expansion, have an opportunity to speak at the Capitol Tuesday. But rather than being there, I may be laying on a table. I don't know. There are going to be times in your life when God's going to interrupt your life and he's going to get your attention because there's some things that he wants to do in you and through you that that's the only way he can do it. And let me tell you what you're going to have to do. Remember, you got to put your what? You got to put your glasses of faith. You got to put your because that's in the Hebrew. That's what the word faith means. It means that you're looking at your life or your situation through the eyes of God what it means and I don't know where you're at today and I don't know what you may be going through but I can tell you this much no matter what it is Jesus Christ loves you and I want you to hear this before we pray go ahead and stand I want to give you hope I want you to listen closely if you're listening say amen, amen. say it with me God is always working always say it again Look at the people around you and say it. God is always God is always working. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we just come to you, and Lord, we love you and we praise you. And Lord, you're a miracle working God. Uh, I got a great cardiologist and sweet man. A lot of precious people there at Baptist Heart, but God, you are, and as you said and a moment ago in the song that we sang, Healing Hearts. So God, you can reach in and touch my heart and bring healing to, to the point the cardiologist says, well, I don't know what it was, but it's healed now. But God, sometimes you don't do that. Sometimes you take us down roads and journeys. Sometimes you give us a special needs child to slow us down and to cause us to be sensitive to others who have special needs children. Sometimes you give us a heart condition or heart problem so that when we see someone who has a scar on their chest, we realize that they've gone down that same road. Sometimes you walk us through cancer. You put us in that treatment where we're getting chemo or radiation in order for us to be able to lift up the banner of Christ as people are sitting there, many of them feeling hopeless and helpless. And you're sitting there with the same chemo, trusting and resting in Christ. Some of us here may be going through relationships where we had a marriage break down, but how better to understand the heart of the broken single mom, single dad, who's trying to make ends meet all by themselves, than to be where they are, to walk down that road. So, Lord, we pray today that you do what, you, what Habakkuk's name meant, Habakkuk. 
that you embrace us, that you wrap your arms around us right now. You whisper in our ear, no matter what problem we may face, no matter that prodigal that may be breaking our heart, may you wrap your arm around mom and dad right now and say, I've got this. God's always working. So every time the enemy, as we sung a moment ago, is lying, father of lies, the accuser of the brethren, the slanderer, diabolos, the devil, Lucifer. May every time, dear Lord, he opens his mouth and says something in our mind, may immediately we say God's always working. May we just begin to whisper that God's always working. God, you're always working, I trust you. And so, Lord, we pray right now that there's a man or woman, boy or girl, the reality is they've never repented of their sin, put their faith and trust in Christ. One day they'll be where I'm at. Oh, they're young people that are listening. They're healthy. They're strong. Got their whole life ahead of them. Boy, have I stood by some of those after they've gotten the news of cancer. How many times have I stood with people who are facing death even at young ages? But if they're lucky... And they live to be my age and be near 70. Oh, they'll face this moment. And in that moment, it won't be a cardiologist and it won't be, a, it won't be medical facilities. They'll be looking to the creator of the universe, Jesus, the great physician. He'll walk into the room. He'll wrap his arm and embrace the cardiologist and he'll guide his hand. And he'll whisper, I've got this. He'll wrap his arm around a prodigal, no matter where that prodigal is, right now, as a parent says, God is always working. He'll wrap his arms and embrace that prodigal. And he'll say, I've got this. I've got this one. Trust me. So, Lord, we pray whatever we're going through, that, Lord, we just lean and rest on you. For the eyes of faith are our glasses put on. And Lord, we'll give you the glory and praise. Lord, if there's a decision that needs to be made, we pray that people will make those decisions now.